Welcome to Clause 8, the voice of IP. Clause 8 is part of IP Watchdog and hosted by Eli Mazur. If you enjoy listening, please subscribe on your favorite podcasting app, share it with others, and leave a five-star rating. This episode features an interview with Bruce McCowan. He is the founder and president of Adam Smith Esquire and has written thousands of articles on the economics of law firms. He is recognized as the world's leading expert in this subject and provides advice to a select number of law firms about how to succeed in the changing legal landscape. The Great Recession spurred lots of talk about innovation, technology, alternative fee arrangements, new compensation structures, and countless of other ways that law firms need to change. However, the economic boom that followed has allowed big law firms to continue to thrive without making any substantial changes. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused painful flashbacks for many law firm leaders who previously navigated the Great Recession. At the same time, the continued uncertainty and uneven impact on the economy has made it much more difficult for law firms to decide what steps need to be taken. For example, in the IP field, there was an initial slowdown of litigation work while patent prosecution work remained relatively stable. On this episode, Eli and Bruce talk about the great financial reset of 2008, how law firms are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, different law firm models, and the business of law. Hi, Bruce. Thank you so much for joining. As I mentioned to you, I've been a longtime reader of Adam Smith ESQ, so it's a, it's an honor to talk to you. And I've obviously started, you know, I've, I've thought about your many articles over the years, and as this pandemic and lockdown started, I started thinking more and more about what I, what I read. I guess before we get to today's about what's going on today in the legal market, I wanted to talk to you about, you know, going back to when you started Adam Smith ESQ in 2003, you obviously practiced for a while and then you were in-house. At what point in your career did you start thinking the way the law firms operate has to change? Was there something that happened or something that led you in that kind of direction? Well, that's a great question. So the honest answer is... I thought that there was something odd about law firms probably by Thanksgiving of my first year as an associate. So started in September, right? By Thanksgiving, I thought, this is one of the weirdest organizations. (laughs) And this was a, a very high caliber Wall Street law firm you know, you'd call it, it it was, you know, they certainly considered themselves a peer of, you know, Davis Polk, Sullivan and Cromwell. There was a firm called Breed, Abbott and Morgan, which uh, had been around for about 125 years at the time, was one of the 10 or 15 largest law firms in New York. It subsequently, for various reasons, which aren't germane to this, because it was way after I left, merged into what today is Winston and Strawn. But I think what triggered it for me, Eli, was how mismanaged associates were. Don't take this the wrong way. I'm I'm not trying to be conceited in the least, but frankly, here at, at at a firm like that, certainly, you had all these, you know, double Ivy League type people walking in and being treated like servants. And it just struck me as the weirdest use of talent. One of the other, you know, so you've invested all this money in these people and they've invested so a lot of money in themselves. <laughs> They're all type A, never met a challenge they couldn't, you know, rise to and defeat handily. And you're keeping them in the dark. Your basic managerial technique seems to be fear and intimidation or, you know, junior high school type things like giving you a big assignment at five o'clock Friday afternoon when the, the partner knew about it for days, if not weeks. And I just thought, this is really strange. But I was determined to find out, you know, having spent (laughs) all the time and sweat of the brow as I had in law school, to see if this was actually something I wanted to do for 40 years. 
but that was my first intimation. And then I guess you went in house, and there you—I I don't know how, how that worked for you, but at least you had some, I guess, say. I'm guessing in you know who the legal counsel are and how Morgan Stanley at the time interacted with them. Is there anything that you learned from that perspective that are kind of surprised you? I guess about the way clients view law firms. Yes, there were two things that surprised me, Eli, and I'm sure this is more sophisticated today, but when I joined Morgan Stanley as a securities lawyer hiring law firms to defend us in securities matters, you know, all over the country, I have no idea how many different law firms we used, but it was probably 150 or 200. And I said to myself, this is nuts. <laughs> a lot of these people are learning on our dime. Was it so many law firms because each in-house attorney would pick their own law firm? Yeah, basically. There was no discipline. There was certainly no comprehensive matter tracking system, which struck me again as, as just odd. If you wanted to know who was working on a case, I'm not making this up. You had to go ask Rich, who was sitting in front of one of the first generation IBM PCs, not networked, but Rich was a, you know, a techie and he had the Excel spreadsheet or however the hell he was tracking it. But you had to ask Rich, be that as it may, I thought this is very strange because we're spending a lot of money on these firms. Wouldn't it make sense to whittle down the preferred counsel list, you know, maybe get such a thing as volume discounts or at least, you know, select firms that know what they're doing with securities litigation? It took me a, a couple of years, but eventually I managed to persuade the general counsel to try that. And it saved... 15% on outside counsel fees in the first year with the level caseload. Wow. It's the second thing I learned, I promised you two, oh, yeah. is that the legal department is a cost center. You are staff, you're not line, and for every time the general counsel argues that we could hire somebody like Bruce instead of renting Davis Polk and save money, for every time the GC says that, which is perfectly rational, the CFO will say something equally rational, which is it's not Morgan Stanley's core competence to build a law firm. I'm getting from that, should is that something you think companies should consider more of, building out their legal departments versus paying exorbitant rates for outside legal services? You know, Eli, I think this just oscillates. Yeah. I think the general counsel wins the argument for a couple of years and the budget increases and, and then the CFO notices that we have this big legal department and says, what's going on here? And I just think it oscillates. Okay, so I am actually, by just by saying that, I'm taking issue with a school of thought which you can read about you know, all over the place, it's not hard to find, that corporate in-house legal departments, headcount and spend will grow to the sky. And I just, no, I, I don't think so. Interestingly, there's research coming out of a, a UK-based firm called Acritas, A-C-R-I-T-A-S, recently acquired by Thomson Reuters. But Acritas is a very sophisticated research organization. They have people all over the world interviewing people all over the world in something like 30 languages, general counsel, law firm, senior leaders, and they spit out an enormous number of data-driven reports, which is music to my ears. <laughs> Adam Smith Esquire tries to, we try to derive or base our work on data as opposed to what, you know, we woke up thinking. But one of the key Acritas findings about corporate legal spend is there's actually an optimal level and that level is between 40 and 70 percent of all your legal costs should be accounted for by your in-house department 
And, you know, if you just think about it for a second, probably if you're a fortune anything company, having no in-house lawyers is wrong. Doing all your legal work in-house is wrong. So if the answer is yeah. not zero and it's not 100, <laughs> where is it? But I guess the issue is, is that, you know, some companies have in-house counsel who are just adding costs because they're not really necessary if they have really competent outside counsel that are doing the work. And some companies are able to kind of replace their outside counsel with in-house counsel. Isn't that the tension? Is it like, are you just adding a layer of costs or are you really saving money by building in that in-house function? So I have a near term and a longer term answer for you. Okay. (laughs) In the near term, just because the, the industry is subject to enormous inertia. Most outside law firms are managed, I use that word advisedly, by in-house lawyers. So it's lawyers managing lawyers. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, homogeneity in how they think, right? They all went to law schools that you and I have probably heard of They were all trained the same way. They actually have very similar psychological makeups, which is a study in in and of itself. At higher levels, you know, maybe in-house counsel have it in the back of their minds that they might find a perch at a law firm again someday. What I'm driving at is there's a great deal of conformity and very little in in thinking between the in-house and the outside lawyers and very little almost no management rigor applied. Right. So that's today. One thing that I think we started to see inklings of after the great financial reset of 2008, and I think the whole COVID thing is just going to put rocket fuel behind this, is what everybody thinks of as legal operations. But I would just call it letting business professionals in the tent who can do things like cost benefit, like project management, resource allocation, process optimization. And I think that the notion that the best person to manage outside counsel is another lawyer is missing a couple of key components. Yes, there needs to be a lawyer in the mix, but there needs to be finance and operational professionals in the mix as well. It brings us to our next topic about the, I think you call it the great reset of 2008. Obviously, you know, you are writing about kind of what law firms need to do to prepare for an event like this. Would that be a fair kind of (laughs) uh, way to put it? And then this event happens. What did you think about how law firms reacted to that? It was interesting to see that even law firms were reacting to that in kind of a lockstep way, but I guess, what did you think of that at the time? Well, I'm going to say one thing that's critical of law firms as an industry and one thing that's laudatory, okay? So the critical part is we've been telling our clients, Adam Smith Esquire, for a couple of years, do recession scenario planning, right? I mean, we've had the wind at our backs economically for a decade, This would be like 2018. We had the wind at our backs for a decade. Yeah. This is not going to go on forever. So what would it look like if you had to cut 15% of your costs across the board? What, What would you do? And if a recession comes, it's very unlikely you'll do exactly what you planned in the scenario, but you've thought about it. You're not caught with your pants down. Anyway, none of our clients took that advice. (laughs) So, you know, it's a thought experiment and and there it shall ever be. And what did they say? I I guess, did they kind of say, oh yeah, that's a good idea and just never got around to it? Or they said, well, that would be awkward or we'll deal with it when it happens or let's see how this quarter goes. I mean, things like that. Yes. So I'm critical of firms for not at least looking at this. I applaud firms for how surprisingly nimble and they've been in responding to this. I mean, 
you know, there were most law firms, one day everybody was in the office and the next day or the next week, nobody was in the office. So that's, that's dramatic, right? You're talking about it right now. Yeah, I mean, now I'm talking about this crisis. So I think law firms, I give credit to law firms for being fairly nimble in enabling, permitting, celebrating kind of work from home. Well, let's see what we can do, you know, to make this work, to keep up everybody's productivity, connectedness, efficiency. We've heard innumerable times, Eli, that productivity is up in law firms that are busy. Yeah. Um, because, you know, there's no commute. There, there aren't people knocking on the door and distracting you. Zoom meetings tend to start and stop on time. Real world meetings don't. <laughs> you know, there are all these things which are really interesting to discover. And the second part of my answer is, I think law firms are being a lot more thoughtful and humane about what they're doing in the COVID crisis than they were in the great financial reset. I mean, if you go back and look at the statistics, because we did, 9% of associates in the AMLAW were fired. Wow. Yeah, and you don't see too many firms firing people today. There's a new word you'd never heard 12 years ago, which is furlough. There's also the concept, which we are big proponents of, of what we call shared sacrifice. So everybody takes a haircut to preserve cash, but it's like the progressive income tax. So the partners take, you know, potentially a big haircut. The receptionist takes a token haircut. And that's important because it's existentially important, I think, because the longer this goes on, the more law firms will fail. I mean, that's just economic reality. They're gonna, some firms are gonna run out of cash. And when that happens, it's lights out. You know, they don't have assets they can sell off. They don't have collateral that they can pledge for a bridge loan. Every firm that failed recently, Howery, Thielen, Dewey, Bingham, you know, you go down the list, they all failed for very different reasons. But what ended their run as going concerns was they ran out of cash. And I am not predicting anything. We have no insight into the, the balance sheets of AMLA 200 firms, but it stands to reason just through the luck of the draw that some firms will be heavyweight in industries that took it on the chin. Some firms will be heavyweight in clients that can't pay their bills. It's just going to happen, and it won't necessarily be anybody's fault, but it's going to happen. Yeah, I guess another tension that I see with this shared sacrifice, obviously, I think people are very understanding at this point, but there are firms that have made it a point to say, we're doing as well as ever. We're not cutting anything right now. Within firms, you're seeing certain practice areas being, and I'm talking about general practice firms, super busy as ever, and some are slowed down. And, you know, I imagine that after a period of time, there's going to be some tension between that partner in that bankruptcy group versus that partner in the state litigation group or whatever it is. How do you see that playing out? Well, you put your finger on something that's dynamite, Eli, because everybody knows partners first and foremost if they're in a, a hot practice area or a warm practice area even, they're very mobile assets. And it doesn't take too many partners, certainly not too many high profile or economically successful partners to leave before everybody else gets spooked. And at some point, and it's faster than you would think, it's too late. There is nothing the firm can do. And unfortunately, I've had a front row seat to a couple of firms where this happened. And literally, you can't exhort people. You, you can't pay them, certainly. There is nothing you can do except try to provide a gentle landing 
for the defenseless people at the firm, which generally means the associates and the staff. So when I talked about firms being more humane and thinking in a more long-term way in this meltdown than they did during the financial meltdown, that's what I meant. I think most well-led, which is different than well-managed, but most well-led law firms are spending a lot of time talking about how we're going to come through this together, how we will be better on the other side, and so forth, to give people a vision. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, you've been a uh encouraging firms to do recession planning during the boom times. I think something else that you write about is that, you know, when everything is going well, it's hard to get law firms to change anything because, you know, if it's not broken, why kind of fix it? But you still see firms talking about other things like the importance of innovation, technology, alternative fee arrangements, new compensation structures. And yet, I started practicing around, you know, 2007. If you look at these big law firms, at least from my vantage point, they're not operating that different than they did back then, even though they talk a lot about these things. No, they're not. You're a thousand percent right. And that's the perfect segue into what else do I think is going on. So it is my devout hope that firms will come out of this realizing there are a lot of things they were doing only because they'd always done things that way. Yeah. The low hanging, the thing that's staring everybody in the eye is office space. It's the second largest expense for a typical law firm after people. I'm not suggesting, you know, you do away with offices. I think people, human beings like to congregate in groups to get things done. It's, it's part of our species secret sauce and has been for a couple hundred thousand years. But what I am suggesting is that firms, as their leases expire, seriously rethink what happens in an office. What can we do in an office that we can't do anywhere else? And my answer is largely collaborate and meet clients. If the answer which has been a large part of the traditional answer is go into a not terribly large room, close the door and open your laptop. No, that's not what you need an office for. So we may not have had the courage to do that, but now the handwriting is on the wall. I'll give you another simple example. In our business, We've been, uh, well, we've had a Zoom account for years. It's like everybody else discovered it. Wait a minute, we were here first. But <laughs> we are definitely spending more time communicating with clients, former clients, potential clients during this than we used to during normal times because I think people long for connection. And you realize it's as easy to connect with people in Amsterdam or Frankfurt or London through Zoom as it is to connect with the guy in the office next door. It doesn't matter. So I hope that that's an enduring change, that firms and lawyers are more open to engaging people who aren't just down the hall, including clients. Yeah. Another topic that you've written a lot about is really of a different type of law firm models. I spent most of my career at boutiques. I'm, I'm a little biased on this question, but I, I kind of want to talk to you about this model, I guess it's ri most written about this big law, classic general practice model. You have every single practice under one roof all around the world. You have firms like Denton's, you know, that have rival headcount to some of these big corporations. And... I guess the theory there is if you're an attorney in one practice group and you have a client and that client needs services from another practice group, it will just be very easy to kind of do business development in that way. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But, you know, when I talk to, in my field, patent attorneys at these firms, they tell me in reality, they have very little contact with attorneys from other practice groups or that's how they get more work. I guess from your viewpoint, 
do you see that happening? Is that really the logic behind these firms or is that is there a different uh, kind of uh, rationale? Well, it's interesting. I, I think that 10 years ago, five years ago, the conventional wisdom in the legal industry was that there was room for those firms, you know, the globe spanning full service firms. I would say today that the conventional wisdom is probably there's room for a few of those firms, but not a lot. And I don't know how many the number is, but it's probably not dozens. So the dynamic that you're talking about, what do clients hire those firms for? And do the firms internally take advantage of the rest of the firm? One of the great CEOs of Hewlett Packard, I I think it was actually David Packard, said it would be wonderful if Hewlett Packard knew what Hewlett Packard knows. <laughs> and and I think that's precisely right about these large law firms. I bet the patent guys don't know that they've got an aircraft finance powerhouse practice. Well, how would you know that? So it kind of defeats the premise. Lawyers are also strong introverts, right? So and not terribly curious. So it, it's unlikely that they'd like to discover everything the firm can do. So that's from the law firm perspective. Then from the client perspective, I think the question is, yeah, we love Eli and his team for patents, but how do we know that his partners in Frankfurt doing the aircraft financing are any good? Right. And Eli doesn't even know the answer to that. So, I think there's always this tension between full service and best of breed. I don't mean to generalize beyond what the data support, but I do think it's a fair statement, Eli, that in the last 20 years, across the economy, across the globe, best of breed is taking share from full service. That's interesting. And actually, I'm going to get to a few examples of those that I want to discuss. I guess another rationale behind these big law firms is that they do have this brand name. And if you're in-house counsel or general counsel at a company, you could spend your time figuring out who is the best of breed, or you could just pick the best well-known brand of law firm. And then if something goes wrong, you could tell the CEO, well, I, I picked the biggest, best law firm there is in the world. It shouldn't be that way, but it seems there's an incentive to operate that way from in-house. Do you see that? You're right. And it's not stupid, okay? <laughs> Which is actually a compliment in our world. If something is not stupid, that's, that's praise. And the sense in which it's not stupid, Eli, is... I actually discussed this in the, in the Brands Win chapter of Tomorrowland, but... It's really hard, almost impossible, for a client to judge the true quality of a lawyer, of legal services, right? Yeah. So if you can't judge quality, I mean, the same with me and and doctors, right? I don't know if he fixed the, the broken leg, you know, that I got skiing. I mean, I'll know when it heals. It'll heal right or it won't, right? How do I know? In the absence of being able to judge quality, you look for proxies like prestige, like brand name, like reputation. Well, they've been around for 100 years. They took Apple public. They took whatever, right? So brands are very sticky. And you also said at the end of your question that there's comfort or there's there's a cover your ass element to hiring a brand. Yeah. And don't underestimate that. I like the, I think you call it the best of class in terms of a a firm that's recently been in the news is Irel and Manella, which is mainly known for patent litigation, but you know, they had actually pretty successful transaction attorneys and they actually made the decision to hyper-focus on what they're really good at. And that seems to be in line with the trend that you're seeing, right? That's not just limited to them. Are more and more firms kind of telling their 
weaker practice areas to kind of find a new home? How's that playing out? Or I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> we often counsel our clients if they're scattered, let's just say. In, yeah. I won't be any more derogatory than that. If Look, Eli, a lot of law firms have grown up more through history and who knew who and so forth than logic, McKinsey-esque quadrant yeah. planning, right? Often you find that there are practice areas that through no fault of their own just really don't fit anymore. Maybe they have different economics, maybe they have there's no overlap between their clients and the rest of the firms, whatever. Corporations spin off divisions all the time. Law firms, it doesn't seem to occur to law firms, but it should because everybody's going to live, right? Everybody's going to be fine. <laughs> if you're a labor lawyer and a, a good one, you probably ought to be at Littler or Ogletree or Jackson Lewis. You're going to be a second class citizen at Weill Gottschall. Why do you want that? Right. I'd like to be core, not periphery. Yeah, that makes sense. And if you are a best of class law firm, I, I guess what is the advantage in you know common term I think is a boutique, right? Where you focus on a yeah. certain type of practice area. Is the advantage that the whole firm is kind of aligned and all the attorneys have the same interest in the same type of technology, the same type of innovation, the same type of fee structure? Is that the main advantage or is there something else, I guess, to it? So the way I would conceptualize it is there's an, there are internal advantages, which you just talked about. You can focus all your you know technology investment on patent prosecution yeah. or whatever. You know, and Littler focuses all its technology investment on employment process optimization. So that's sort of the internal advantage. And everybody's aligned. You've, I'm sure you've got, everybody has basically the same revenue model. You don't have fixed fees and billable and premiums and caps and collars and all this nonsense. Also, because you, because the firm has big data about how patent prosecution cases go, you can offer flat fees with much higher confidence. So here's the bell curve of what patent prosecution cases cost. We're going to price it at 70% of the bell curve. So we're going to make money more often than we lose. But meanwhile, the client loves it because it's a flat fee. I mean, that's how life insurance works, right? You could buy a policy and die tomorrow, but it tends not to happen. Then the other conceptual perspective is external. If I'm the GC of a high-tech company and I'm spinning off all these patents or potential patents, I want to go to somebody who does this for a living. Back to my broken leg, right, which was a long time ago, but I <laughs> obviously remember it. I wanted to go to the hospital emergency room where they had an orthopedic surgeon who had already set three skiers' legs that weekend, right? I want to go to the expert. And I did. <laughs> and it worked out fine. But it's the same analysis. So let's say you're a business person at a company listening to this and you know your company is using all of one firm, one firm for all of their legal services. Should that bother you? I guess. So the answer is not necessarily. But it would take some research into the caliber of service that that firm was delivering across my Fortune 1000 company to figure that out. And you know what I would do as a very blunt instrument to begin with? I would survey every manager in my firm who'd interacted with outside counsel in a, you know, in a meaningful way. And I would just ask them, grade this firm on the famous net promoter scores scale, which is, you know, from one to 10, how likely would you be to recommend this firm to a friend or colleague? You get this from Delta and United and American every time you take a flight, <laughs> but there's actually a name for it and it's called the net promoter score. And it's brilliant because it kind of encapsulates so many things in one question. The most important thing in Lawland that it embraces without having to say it explicitly is degree of difficulty. So 
if the result the firm got was bad, but the facts were horrific, that's a good outcome. <laughs> yeah. You know, as I was preparing for this interview to talk with you, there was a story yesterday which kind of highlighted a lot of these themes. A panel litigation attorney, Fred Fabricant, and I might be mispronouncing it, he's taking his patent litigation group from Brown and Rudnick and starting his own boutique that's just going to be focused on IP litigation. And the two main reasons he gave, it seemed to me, was one is he wanted to use alternative fee arrangements and it seems Brown Rodnick would not let him do that. And to me, it was kind of, what? You have a successful practice with this economic climate, and yet this firm is still not adjusting to this reality of what these practice area needs to be successful. I guess, am I being uh, Pollyannish, I guess, about this, the way these kind of... <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I'd say, and I know nothing about that particular situation. I didn't even know the story before you just described it. But I guess I'd have two observations. One is, there are two sides to everything, you know. Yeah. You could always ask Brown Rudnick why this guy was a pain in the neck and they're glad to see him go or whatever. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know what they're going to say. They probably wouldn't say that, not on the record. The other dimension, which is probably omnipresent in the legal industry, is lawyers are by and large not good business people. So it's possible that the Brown-Rudnick decision was not a sound business decision. It happens. We see it a lot. <laughs> right. But do you think that when they're doing it, they're saying, well, it's not an economic issue for us, it's X? Or do you think they are making a sound business decision? So I guess the first question I would ask the executive committee or whatever of a law firm debating whether to jettison or invest more in a practice, because it's the same question, just from different ends, is is this practice strategic to your law firm? And if it's peripheral, the answer is you don't want to invest any more in it. So the easy case is, yes, it's strategic. We want to invest more. And it's not strategic. We don't want to spend another nickel. Those are the, those are the easy cases, right? They're the opposite corners of the quadrant. But there's two other corners, which are really the most interesting corners. It's strategic but we've been investing in it for a long time and we haven't gotten anywhere. That's one corner. Yeah. Or it's not strategic, but it costs us nothing and it throws some profit our way. Yeah. <laughs> this is just the way I think, Eli. <laughs> I, I, I don't think like a lawyer. I think like an economist or a, or a business person. So, so th there might be other considerations. I guess it's not as simple as yeah. just before we get off, off that boutique and, you know, this example, there are boutiques, for example, there's IP boutiques that do every possible IP service imaginable. And there's somewhat like a general practice firms in, in that one attorney can do the work of another firm, right? And then you see these micro boutiques, which really focus on a very narrow area. Each, each situation is unique, but, you know, when you talk best of class, are the advantages of a boutique get better and better the narrower your focus is, or how do you view that? So I would say a boutique, it's hard for a boutique to be too narrow with two enormous caveats. The first caveat is that you're really good at it you are a destination for whatever it is. And second, that the market for that is sufficient to satisfy your ambitions. So I could be a boutique litigation shop in Bangor, Maine. There's probably not gonna be all that much litigation in Bangor. Yeah, that makes and the reason I was thinking about that is because I read this story, but you, I come across a lot of these stories where successful in my field, patent litigation attorneys leave these large firms to start their own practices. They have great clients. Their plans seem very exciting. And some of them really take off. And some of them just plateau. You know, they start with three attorneys. Ten years later, they have three attorneys. 
I guess, why is it that some succeed, you know, and these are successful attorneys who are managed to become a partner at one of these large firms, but when they go on their own, they kind of plateau while others really take off. And, and obviously it could be the size of the market, like you said, but I mean, let's say you're a partner in one of these firms and you're thinking about doing this. Like, what should you know about yourself or something like that? My, I, okay, I'm going to offer you a guess, Eli, but a guess yeah. with a high degree of confidence. None of those firms that plateau, plateau because they weren't good enough lawyers. I'm sure they are all great lawyers. Yes. Yeah. So the difference is, can they build business? Do they have processes and techniques that they can repeat to build business? If you're gonna rely on meeting people at the country club or the church or synagogue for business, it's gonna be really random. You need to publish, you need to speak, you get to you need to get your name out there, you need to get involved in, you know, civic groups where business leaders are involved in the same civic groups. Somebody asked me years ago, you know, how did you build Adam Smith Esquire? Was it the speaking? Was it the publishing? Was it the conferences, the interviews with journalists? And I said, you know, it was cumulative. It's just like all those things. Well, I read something Bruce wrote, and then lo and behold, he's going to be speaking somewhere. And then Bloomberg Law interviewed him. Hmm, what do you know? <laughs> so it's not because of their legal skills. It has to do with their vision and hunger, frankly, for building a boutique law firm. I guess if you were starting out as an attorney now, what advice would you give to an attorney starting out in terms of type of firm or type of practice in any, you know, quick thought about that, that they should be thinking about? My number one piece of advice would be dive into the practice of law, the nitty gritty of it. And soon enough, you will know whether you love it. If you don't love it, get out. <laughs> because there are people who love it and they will win. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Bruce. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. 